<clears throat> well, yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, it's an honor and a big pleasure to speak here. Um, so my talk will be about um, the relationship between two actually quite different, apparently quite different things, locally symmetric spaces and color representations. So those are two things linked by very strong conjectures that fits into the realm of the Langlands program. And by now there are also some pretty general theorems. And um, what I want to do in the talk is to <coughs> explain some of the general features of, of this kind of theorem, those kind of theorems that we can prove uh, in a very specific example, so, but which is somehow representative of some of the features that, of the general situation. And so let me start by some, uh, giving you an instance of this relationship between locally symmetric and color representations, which is like made like a very concrete example. So let's say it's the following specific hyperbolic three manifold. Um, so we look at some kind of geometric object, the hyperbolic three manifold. I will say more about how this is constructed in a second. Let me just say that uh, the kind, it's called a Bianchi manifold, and so they were introduced by the differential geometer Bianchi already in the late 19th century, so they're uh, quite classical objects. And so what I'm interested here in here is the homology of this hyperbolic three manifold. So it's something which would uh, somehow belongs to the world of topology or geometry. So here H3 is the hyperbolic three space. I will define it later. And gamma is some very specific group. Um, I wrote it down here. Um, so it's a subgroup of SL2 of the Gaussian integers. And so those you can represent by some matrices A, B, C, D, where all these A, B, C, D are Gaussian integers, so some of uh, complex coordinates plus the real imaginary part are integers. And I put some very specific congruence conditions on, on the entries in this matrix. <coughs> All right, so that's some thing. And the other object I want to consider is some very specific polynomial. Some polynomial of fourth degree with integer coefficients. And so certainly an object of the field of number theory or algebra. And so I claim that there is some, uh, uh, a direct link between these two objects, uh, which is not very clear where it comes from. So and so some of our starters, probably the first relationship you will recognize between these two objects is uh, the appearance of the number 183, both in the congruence condition there, and as a discriminant of this polynomial, that's not a coincidence. Uh, but of course, there's more to this. Um, all right, so let's, ah, I should say that uh, this example was computed by Figueredo in a thesis in 1998. Although even in this example, what Figueredo could observe was somewhat just some empirical evidence that there is a relation between these two gadgets. But to prove this, somehow actually, he couldn't prove it then. Uh, so I'm talking about locally symmetric spaces. So let's first recall what symmetric spaces are. So symmetric spaces are some connected Riemannian manifolds, so manifold equipped with a metric, uh, with a condition that at any point of the space, there is an isometric reflection. So on the tangent space, it's minus the identity at this point. And so all of these symmetric spaces of the form that they're highly symmetric. So in particular, there's a lead group G of isometries of X, which acts transitively on the space X. And the stabilizer of any point will be uh, a compact subgroup of this lead group. All right. And so maybe the first example of such a thing, well, the sphere would be an example, but uh, also hyperbolic two space would be an example. So that's the, you can think of this as the upper half plane. So all complex numbers whose imaginary part is positive. Um, I also wrote down the metric and I hope I have this right. And uh, <coughs> then if you want to represent it in this way, you can let uh, SL2 of the reals act on this by fractional linear transformations and then the stabilizer of the point i uh, in the upper half plane will be SO2, or plus or minus SO2. Um, so this is a very well-studied object in many areas. And I mean, number theory in particular gives rise to what we call the modular curves. So in this case, you could let SL2 of the integers act on this uh, to produce the modular curves. But I want to step up one dimension for this talk and look at hyperbolic three space. 
And so, because there are several phenomena uh, that are quite different between these two cases. So, uh, it's a three dimensional manifold. You can define it, say, as a product of the complex numbers and the positive reals. And so, the metric takes a very similar form. So, it's one over the, the y squared with uh, these coordinates. And so, you can somehow regard it as somehow everything living over the ground. Uh, I will draw a picture. There will be a picture in a second. So uh, in this case, a group of uh, a Lie group of isometries of the sky is given by SL2 of the complex numbers now. So we replace the reals by the complex numbers. And we need to replace this compact subgroup here by the maximal compact subgroup of SL2 of the complex numbers, which would be SU2. And that, that's the stabilizer of a point. All right. And so uh, what we're doing now is we take some uh, arithmetic subgroup of SL2 of the complex numbers. So the ones I want to consider of the following form. So you take uh, matrices wi which are some, uh, where the entries live in some imaginary quadratic number field. So you take some imaginary quadratic number field K. For most of the talk, actually, I will just take the square root of minus 1. And then uh, by OK, I denote the swing of integers. So for example, if K was square root of minus 1, then OK would just be the Gaussian integers here, John I. And then I look at a subgroup of SL2 of this, uh, where I put some congruence conditions on A, B, C, and D. And if you put enough congruence conditions, you can ensure that this is a torsion-free subgroup, uh, which is important. So if you want to take the quotient of this upper x, here was the upper half plane, I can consider x gamma, uh, the quotient of x by the action of gamma. So recall that some SL2 of the complex numbers acted as isometries on the hyperbolic three space, and so if you have a subgroup that contains the quotient, you still have some Riemannian manifold. And it's actually a manifold because I assume this is torsion free, this means that this action has no stabilizers here, and so it's a free action, you have a very nice quotient. So the quotient turns out to be a finite volume but non-compact hyperbolic three manifold. And I think now comes the picture that I try to draw. So let me try to say what this means. Uh, so I here looked at the example where uh, I take the full congruence subgroup. And so then it will actually not be a manifold, which is related to these strange cusps that you see here. <coughs> Those would go away if I pass to some finite index subgroup given by some congruence conditions. And so what happens here is that hyperbolic three space is everything that lies on top of, of the ground. Um, the ground itself can some is a plane, you can identify it with the complex numbers, and inside the complex numbers you somehow have this Gaussian lattice given by the uh, points somehow of the John I, so here it might, might be 0, 1, I, 1 plus I, etc. And then you draw these half circles around these points, so those will somehow be minimal surfaces inside, inside hyperbolic three space. So you might be a bit more familiar with a two-dimensional picture of two-dimensional hyperbolic space where you would have these half circles which correspond to geodesics in that space. Um, so drawing all these half circles, uh, or half spheres around these points, and then you also take the rays on top of these points, and they turn out to uh, bound the fundamental domain uh, for this quotient. So you get, you get the manifold you're interested in by some, uh, identifying the front and the back of this, etc. Right. And as part of this picture, you maybe recognize the fundamental domain, which is probably the more famous picture. If you just do this for SL2 of the integers acting on two-dimensional hyperbolic space, so if I just take this part here, then this will somehow exactly correspond to this more classical picture. All right. So that's my object of interest on the geometric side. And so, uh, as I said, I wanted to consider the homology groups of these guys. So I'm interested in the homology of these Bianchi manifolds. And uh, these are some finitely generated B groups. Uh, they are non-zero only. Well, in general, they might be non-zero from zero up to the dimension, which would be three. But because this guy is non-compact, it only actually only goes up to two. <coughs> and there's some Poincare duality which relates what happens in degree one with what happens in degree two. So the most interesting one is actually the first homology group. But the first homology group we can actually define without knowing anything about homology. So it's just the abelianization of the fundamental group of this 
uh, of this manifold, the maximally being quotient. But it's a fundamental group. Uh, well, you know what the fundamental cover is. Because hyperbolic three space maps to this, it's contractible. And uh, so it must be the universal cover. And then the group of deck transformations is gamma. So it's just the abelianization of this group gamma. So it's something quite explicit. That you could also define without reference to this hyperbolic three manifold just in terms of gamma. But uh, to study these homology groups is actually uh, very useful to have this hyperbolic three manifold inside. Because otherwise, already the statement that these are finitely generated B and groups would be very non trivial. And so, uh, as any finitely generated B and group, you can decompose it into a torsion free part and some torsion part. And the rank of the torsion free part is call, uh, called the first Betty number of, uh, <coughs> of this gadget. And so, um, quite a bit is known about how large this torsion free part is and how large the torsion part is. And so, for example, uh, it turns out that the first Betty number is actually usually quite small. So, for example, there's a theorem of Luke which says that as you let the congruent subgroup become smaller and smaller, you somehow get a, s a sequence of hyperbolic manifolds which are covers of each other and become larger and larger and in some sense converge to the hyperbolic three space. Then Luke proved that uh, the first Betty number grows slower than the volume of these hyperbolic three manifolds. So, the limit of uh, as gamma goes to zero, of the first Betty number over the volume is zero. <coughs> um, on the other hand, for these Bianchi manifolds, it turns out that there's a, a whole lot of torsion in these Bianchi manifolds. And I just wanted to give you an impression. I want to give, show you this example computed by Sengun. Uh, so in SL2Z, I join I, I take some congruent subgroup. Where the <laughs> you might say that this is quite a large modulus already, but it's not so big anyway. I mean, in any case, in this case, this very, very large prime already divides the order of this torsion subgroup. So there's this torsion subgroup contains torsion for some very sporadic, very, very big primes. And if I would replace zero join i here by zero join square root of minus seven or something like this, and take the same kind of modulus, then the primes I think would be still three times more digits or something. And <coughs> in fact, this. Uh, is expected to be quantifiable how large this is. Namely, there's a conjecture by Bergeron and Venkatesh, which says that the order of this um, torsion subgroup grows exponentially in the volume of, of this manifold. So the Betty number grows sublinearly, but this grows exponentially in the volume. So it's really big. And <coughs> there's a lot of evidence for this conjecture, both numerically and there are also theorems in slightly different situations. Uh, by Bergeron Venkatesh, by Jonathan Pfaff, who was here in Bonn, Jean Rambeau, and others. Um, they all rely actually on Werner Müller's theorems on analytic torsion. So it turns out that there is an analytic way of computing the size of this torsion subgroup and that's being used. <coughs> all right. um, so that's one side uh, of the picture. And now I want to speak about the uh, relation to, to Galois representation. And so, uh, first experiments in this direction actually were made by Grunewald, who was also here in Bonn, um, in the 1970s, uh, the late 1970s. Uh, precise conjecture was made later by Avner Asch in 1990. Uh, but I'm only going to state a very rough theorem. Um, I will later <coughs> make the statement more precise. But what the theorem says in particular is the following. So assume you have some such congruent subgroup as we had. Um, and assume that some prime divides the order of this torsion subgroup. Then the statement is that there will exist somewhere some gamma extension of this uh, field K we're interested in. I call it K gamma P because it depends on gamma on this prime P I chose. It actually depends on slightly more, but I suppress it. Um, with Galois group, so it's some group of automorphisms of this over K, is contained in this uh, PGL2 of FP bar. FP is the field with P elements, FP is bar, so it's algebraic closure. When generically it will actually be just PGL2 FP, uh, which is in some sense associated with this torsion class, and that's actually, uh, you have to make this precise, but 
Uh, I won't do it now, but in a second. Um, what did I want to say about this? So I mean, this k-gamma p summer concretely just means that there is some polynomial as I was writing down, like this x to the 4 minus 7 x squared minus 3x plus 1, uh, which has something to do with this torsion class. And I want to say what, what the relation is. Uh, just now I want to make some comments on uh, the theorem. So the theorem, of course, is more precise. It's also more general. Um, I was considering here the case of SL2 or GL2, it doesn't make a big difference, over an imaginary quadratic field. But actually, you can replace GL2 by GLN, and this field may actually be at any totally real OCM field. So for example, it would also work for GLN of the rational numbers, or for GLN of this imaginary quadratic field, or quite a large generality. Um, a similar result for the torsion-free part had actually been obtained slightly earlier by Harris, Lund, Taylor, and Thorne. <coughs> but as we saw uh, in this case of these, hyperbolic, of these Bianchi manifolds, these hyperbolic sphere manifolds, there's actually a lot more torsion than there is torsion-free part. So the Betty number is quite small. So there are not so many, uh, there's not so a large part of, I mean, there's a large part of the homology, and I mean, all the torsion that's not covered by the result. Um, but there's also forthcoming work of Boxer in the torsion case, uh, which I think reproves this result. Uh, but I think it's not quite as strong. Um, using the methods of Harris, Lund, Taylor, and so on. I mean, building on. All right. Um, so what's the relation between? Uh, this uh, torsion class and the homology of this Bianchi manifold and this Golov extension. So I want to describe some properties of the associated extension. Um, so one property concerns the ramifications. That's some of the statements that this 183 that you saw in the first part and the 183 that you saw in the second part are related. So for this, let's fix some n, which in this case would be 183, uh, such that you're only putting congruence conditions modulo this number n. Um, then what turns out to be true is that this extension is what's called unramified in algebraic number theory at all primes not dividing n times p. So it's all, you must always allow ramification at the prime p where there's torsion and otherwise only where you have level. Um, so because of this example of this very big prime dividing the torsion subgroup, it's somehow, the theorem produces an inter -exten interesting extension of Q adjoin I, which is ramified only at two primes, but whose Galois group is this very, very big group. And so if you try to write down by hand some, uh, something with these properties, you will run into big trouble. And actually, um, uh, the proof of Fermat's last theorem was based on, his, on the fact that it's not possible to have something similar over the rational numbers. Uh, so for the rational numbers, it's usually not possible to have uh, such a Galois extension, which is only ramified at one small prime and a very big prime, whose Galois group is somehow GL2 of this very big prime. <coughs> which is related to the fact that for GL2 over the integers, there would be no torsion in this locally symmetric space. So it's, yes, the existence of these <coughs> of these extensions of Q adjoin I is something very specific to the imaginary quadratic case, or the case of fields other than the rational numbers. All right, but uh, that gives you, I mean, that's not a very precise statement about the relation between these, uh, this torsion class and the skull representation. It just gives a very first property that the skull extension has. And so I want to describe more precisely the relationship, and for this I need to uh, introduce hack operators. And so hack operators, you have one for any prime ideal uh, of, uh, of your number field, or of this imaginary quadratic field here, uh, which I should assume is not some, uh, one of the bad primes here, not dividing n times p. <coughs> um, so I look at the following subgroup. Uh, I impose an additional congruence condition for this lower, lower en entry here, that it's zero modulus of prime ideal. And let's assume, actually, that uh, this prime ideal is generated by one element. Uh, so this happens, for example, for the Gaussian integers, which I'm interested in. Um, then you can conjugate by this element, which is now <coughs> not in SL2. It's just in GL2. But conjugation somehow 
preserves SL2 and uh, actually gives a second map from gamma not p to gamma. So what happens is that somehow it divides C by this element xp, but because I assumed this congruence condition, it's somehow now still integral, and now b is multiplied by p, xp instead. And so what you get from this is a self-correspondence. So these are both finite covering maps. And somehow you don't quite have a map from x gamma to x gamma given by the action of this element. But somehow the action of this element at least gives you a correspondence between this. And this is still good enough. So if you had a map between two manifolds, you would get a map on homology. It's covariant. Um, you still get a map if you just have a correspondence. You can somehow integrate along fibers. So pull push along this correspondence defines what's called a hack operator. So self map from uh, from the homology to itself. So this means that actually this homology is not just um, a BN group without extra structure. It carries lots of extra endomorphisms given by these hack operators, and uh, these uh, operators commute for varying prime ideals. That's a basic fact about them. And so in particular, there exist simultaneous eigenvectors for these TP. At least if you take homology in some algebraic closed field. And so now we can state the theorem uh, somewhat more precisely. <coughs> um, so instead of taking, assuming that there's just some p-torsion homology, let me actually look at, <coughs> so if there's p-torsion homology, then in particular the first homology group with fp coefficients is non-zero. Now if I want eigenvectors, I better go to some algebraic closed field, so let's look at homology with fp bar coefficients, and then... Uh, if it's non-zero, then somehow there are such eigenvectors uh, for all the hack operators, and those I call the hacker eigenclass. And so then associated to this hacker eigenclass, there will be a Galois extension, which is somehow what I called this K sub gamma and P previously, uh, whose Galois group is still somehow contained in PGL2 FP bar. And now I should say uh, something about the relation between this Galois extension and these uh, uh, hack operators. And so there's a precise statement. I just want to make a slightly vague statement that uh, for any prime ideal, I can also look at how it decomposes uh, in the scholar extension. So it's makes it precise later. In an example, you will see what this means. And this is related to the eigenvalue of the second operator on this class. All right. So at this point, I want to get back to the specific example from the first slide. Uh, so in this example, we had uh, this specific congruent subgroup uh, of SL2 and join of the uh, Gaussian integers. And then in this case, the first Betty number is actually zero. So the first homology is just some torsion, torsion group. And uh, I don't know whether it has now been computed what precisely it is, but what Figueredo certainly computed is that it has some non-trivial uh, three torsion element. And so if I look at homology with F3 coefficients, then there will be a Hecker eigenclass alpha. It's actually already defined. The eigenvalues are already defined over F3. I don't need to go to an algebraic closure. So, and so he explicitly uh, determined this Hecker eigenclass. I mean, as I said, some this homology is just the abelianization of this group gamma, so you, I mean, this is something you can really compute. Um, and so, uh, for each prime, which does not divide these, those bad primes, given by 183, so actually, in general, I would also, 3 would also be a bad prime because I'm doing cohomology uh, with coefficients in F3, but I mean, 3 already divides 183, so I mean, just 3 and 61 are bad. Um, <coughs> the eigenvalue of TP on this class alpha will be an element of, well, F3 or Z mod 3C, and so the element of this you can call 0, plus, minus, and minus 1. Um, so the next slide will give you the first few primes of Z adjoin I, which do not divide 183, and the corresponding eigenvalue of uh, the sec operator. And so this is something you can easily compute on a computer. Um, so the primes here are 1 plus i. So the norm of the prime is always some, uh, it takes the norm of this element. So it's like, in this case, it's 3 squared plus 2 squared, which would be uh, 13. And so those turn out to be rational primes here. Um, and so over 2, there's just one prime. Over the others, there are always two primes. 
And then there would also be some which stay a prime, but uh, I didn't go so far. And so uh, you can compute what the eigenvalues are. And for some reason, it turns out that whenever you have two primes which have the same norm, then the eigenvalue is the same, which is not a priori clear. Anyway, so you, you get the sequence of numbers. For any prime, you get the number which is either 1, minus 1, or 0. So that's what you get from some, uh, this purely topological business. And there's no number zero yet. But there is a mere remaining row in this diagram, and so let's fill this in. So I said that there should be a relation to this polynomial x to the fourth minus 7x squared minus 3x plus 1. And more precisely, there should be a relation to how p decomposes. And concretely, what this means is that one does the following. So one can look at whether this uh, equation that this is zero has a solution modulus is prime. And you can check that the mod 2 is this x equal to 1 is the solution because 1 minus 7 minus 3 plus 1 is divisible by 2. And gave some other solutions in the other cases, and in the last two cases you can check that there's no solution. And uh, you see that there's also a 0 here. And that's not a coincidence. Oops. So let me get back to the question from the first slide. What is the relation between the following, so the homology of the sky and this polynomial? And now I can give you the answer. Uh, it's some non-abelian reciprocity law. So <coughs> what happens in this example is that this Galois extension uh, corresponding to this Hecke eigenclass alpha I was considering will just be the splitting field of this, this specific polynomial. And then the main result I discussed implies the following quite concrete statement that there is a solution to the equation that da, 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 da is equal to zero in this finite, I mean, in mod p if and only if the Hecke eigenvalue is non-zero. So the way to look at this is that this is some instance of a general non-abelian reciprocity law, which generalizes Gauss's quadratic reciprocity law, which I was just gives the simplest case of here. So there's a solution to x squared plus 1 is equal to 0 in the module p, if, say p is not 2, p is somehow a bad prime for this equation, um, if and only if p is 1 mod 4. And so I guess this whole business of the relation between locally symmetric spaces and color representations is somehow about generalizing uh, the abelian reciprocity law, such as Gauss's quadratic reciprocity law, uh, to non-abelian extensions. What does non-abelian here mean? It just means that the Galois group of this extension k alpha over k is a non-abelian group. So actually, <coughs> the group will turn out to be the alternating group on four letters. And what's interesting about this example is that it, I mean, this polynomial could it's already defined over the rational numbers. In general, the theorem would only give you a polynomial summer with coefficients in this field k. So you could also co already consider the splitting field over the rational numbers. In that case, it must correspond to what one calls an even Artin representation over the rational numbers. <coughs> and the even Artin and Artin representations, they are very annoying to number series because they don't correspond to anything in the homology of locally symmetric spaces. Um, so, <laughs> It's very subtle to formulate a reciprocity law for this polynomial over the rational numbers, but there is such a reciprocity law if you go to an imaginary quadratic field. Because after you go to an imaginary quadratic field, some of this evenness uh, makes no sense anymore. Anyway. Um, how much time do I have? A lot of time. Um, <coughs> so where does... Where does this extension actually come from? So I said that there is somewhere this, this uh, Bianchi manifold, this hyperbolic extreme manifold, it starts all life as a purely topological object, and then there's somewhere suddenly this, uh, <coughs> this polynomial generating this, uh, which, has, which has something to do with the situation. Um, the philosophical answer to this is that it's some kind of mod p version of uh, the Langlands correspondence. So let me briefly say uh, what I mean by this. So if I <coughs> would instead look at the cohomology not with uh, fp, not p coefficients, but with integral coefficients, or let's say with complex coefficients, so this still somehow sees the first Betty number here, um, then in general by a theorem of Franke, you can relate this to the automorphic forms, well, on SL2 or maybe on GL2, doesn't really matter in this case. Um, automorphic forms on GL2 over this field K. <coughs> and then the Langlands conjectures predict a very general relation between automorphic forms 
And what in the most general case you would maybe call motives or so over this field K, whatever they are. But uh, concretely, any motive at least gives you some Galois representation. So it, uh, some map into GL2 of QP bar. And so the idea is that if homology with QP bar coefficients corresponds to in some way to Galois representation with QP bar coefficients, then maybe homology with FP bar coefficients corresponds to Galois representations with FP bar coefficients. Um, I mean, at this point, I should maybe say that I heard uh, that at some point uh, when Grunewald made these uh, computations in the late 70s, he was giving a talk, which also Langlands attended, and somehow Langlands somehow seemed to say that he, he totally didn't understand what he meant. <laughs> so Langlands wasn't convinced that there should be this mod p version. So, but it's still what underlies uh, philosophically this. Uh, construction. Um, so where does, okay, but philosophy doesn't prove anything. So where does this actually come from? How do we, can we actually construct this extension? And I mean, I don't really have a good answer for this. I mean, the construction for this is extremely indirect. And uh, I want to go through the rough construction uh, in a second. Um, but I want to point out that uh, there is a more familiar situation a more and much more classical situation where the relation between these homology groups and color representation is much more transparent. And that's this example of the modular curve that I've been somehow running over. So in the case where you would consider just a two-dimensional hyperbolic space and divide by a congruent subgroup of SL2 of the integers. Um, right, so if I take such a congruent subgroup and I take this quotient, <coughs> then hyperbolic space, two-dimensional hyperbolic space carries a canonical complex structure because it sits inside the, comp it's the upper, upper complex half plane, so it sits in the complex numbers, has a complex structure which is preserved by the action. And so, uh, in fact, this becomes some <laughs> Riemann curve, and in fact, a smooth, an algebraic one, is a smooth algebraic curve of the complex numbers. And in fact, this algebraic curve, <coughs> if you define it through algebraic equations, uh, the coefficients, you can usually choose them over to, to be rational. Um, abstractly, some of this can be considered as a moduli space of elliptic curves, and this interpretation makes it possible to uh, define it over the rational numbers. Uh, maybe I have to join some roots of unity in general. But anyway. And so, <coughs> at this point, you can invoke the Grotenik's et al. cohomology machinery, which says that whenever you have a variety which is defined over the rational numbers, then there will be an action of the absolute Galois group of Q uh, on the homology groups, maybe not with Z coefficients, but at least with ZP coefficients for any P. <coughs> so in this case, the homology itself is a Galois representation, and so you get this physical Galois action there, and hence these Galois uh, representations that you're interested in. And so, I mean, I guess the names I should mention here are Aishla Shimura, uh, Delean, Langlands, etc. And um, there are also higher dimensional, maybe I should say this, so there are also higher dimensional analogs of this kind of situation where this locally symmetric space uh, is defined over the rational numbers, it's an algebraic variety, etc. And so where one gets again Galois actions on etal cohomology, and this is the subject of Shimura varieties, which was studied extremely much um, in number theory. and by now we understand the, uh, the Galois actions on the cohomology of the Shimura varieties very well and can construct a lot of instances of such relations between locally symmetric space and Galois representations, those cases which come, which admit this algebraic structure. But in contrast, these Bianchi manifolds, they are not at all algebraic. They don't even have a complex structure, right? I mean, if it's something algebraic, it should at least be a complex manifold because I mean, we pass to the complex points. Uh, but its real dimension is three, so there is no chance at all that this has a complex structure. Hence, no algebraic structure, and there will not be any Galois action on its singular homology. So the Galois action needs to come from somewhere different. <coughs> and so uh, the steps of the construction are as follows, and uh, I apologize that now a lot of machinery will suddenly appear. Um, 
So the first thing you do is you want to relate your, you have this very non-algebraic guy, and you want to relate it to something which has an algebraic structure to some, uh, get your hands in any way on it. And that's done by embedding it as a boundary component uh, of some higher, I guess in this case, eight-dimensional manifold, complex four-dimensional manifold, uh, corresponding to a unitary group of signature 2-2. Two, two. Um, so this uh, locus symmetric space for this unitary group of signature 2-2 two, two will be non-compact, and in, 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 a, in the boris compactification at the boundary, you will see <coughs> you will see these locally symmetric spaces for, for this imaginary quadratic field, for GL2 of this imaginary quadratic field. So the funny thing about this boris compactification is that in general, it I mean, it compactifies an algebraic variety, but in a very non-algebraic way. And so in the boundary, you have a chance of seeing very non-algebraic stuff. So you construct, and <laughs> there's a theory of Eisenstein series, which is somehow related to the boundary. And so everything that comes from the boundary in this business is somehow called Eisenstein for this reason. So uh, Eisenstein class is just a number series name for stuff that comes from the boundary. Um, all right. And now you at least you are on some algebraic variety, so you feel slightly better. But uh, it's still a torsion class. You can't relate it to, like, you feel home as soon as you have some classical automorphic representation. Then, then you feel fine. And so that's uh, the content of step two. Uh, which is some, uh, the only step that I contributed to here, um, that all cohomology classes on these locally symmetric, I mean, on these kind of locally symmetric spaces that emit a structure of algebraic variety, on them everything can be approximated by classical automorphic forms, so technically I said cusp forms here. And so this means that we are somehow in the usual Langlands world now. So we've lift, in particular, we've lifted any torsion class to... Uh, to a characteristic zero class. So in some sense, for these kind of local symmetric spaces which have an algebraic structure, you can prove that there's not much torsion. All torsion can somehow be explained by stuff that lifts to characteristic zero. Um, what this also says is that, so cusp form is, is a technical term for something that does not come from the boundary. So it's more, if you do it analytically, then some of cusp forms are or well, it's orthogonal to uh, all the Eisenstein classes. But this theorem also tells you that if you do this periodically, then actually you can always find some congruence between stuff that comes from the boundary, some Eisenstein class, and some cusp form. So it's producing very general congruences between stuff from the boundary and stuff from the interior. And uh, now you do a lot of Langlin stuff. So now you have this cusp form on this unitary group, and then there is something called uh, automorphic... Uh, Functoriality, um, which in this case would go from this unitary group to GL4 over this imaginary quadratic field. And actually it goes to some specific kind of form there. And uh, that's the kind of situation that, you can, uh, that falls into the realm of what's called endoscopy by Langlands. And in this case, a lot of progress was made. And so for the specific thing that I need, you can get this from results of Labesse, Morel in particular by Shin. But on the other hand, uh, because of the fundamental lemma was proved by Lemong and Go, and then there's a lot of work of Walz Berger on the stabilization of the twisted trace formula, and so on, and so on, and so on, and there's a very long book by Arthur, which was adapted to unitary groups by Mock, and so on. I mean, you have very general theorems of this form now, that you can go from this unitary group to GL4. <coughs> and then you can go back from GL4 to a unitary group of sig different signatures, 3-1, using essentially the same result. And then you find the Galois representation in the etal cohomology of the corresponding algebraic variety. So that's some, uh, the analog of what happens for the modular curve. And so uh, here the results are due to Kotwitz and Clausel, and then by Harris, Taylor, Shin, and Shin, Evier, Harris, the most general result in this case. <coughs> and so after applying all of these steps, you somehow end up with a Galois representation. But uh, it's very indirect. All right, and so if I, yes, I have time. Um, <coughs> and some sense, steps three and four were well understood by, uh, for some time now, even if some of the, um, all the details of, of this were only very recently written. <coughs> and uh, the key new step 
in the proof is the step two that you can always uh, lift everything to cusp forms in this general setup. Um, so let me explain a bit more about this uh, key step here. So here you have uh, what's called a Hermitian symmetric space. So it's one where well, this also has a complex structure preserved as a group G. And so in this case, uh, this quotient x by gamma uh, is a complex manifold, but actually by a theorem of Bailey and Borel, it admits the structure of an algebraic variety with the complex numbers. But like for the modular curve, it's even defined over a number field. So in general, it's certainly defined over Q bar, which follows from, a uh, from an argument of faultings. Um, and there are finer statements by Shimura, Deline, et cetera, uh, that actually I don't need this for this. So it's some algebraic variety over some finite extension of Q. And uh, to state the theorem, I need to make some technical assumption that this is a Fudge type, which is satisfied in all cases of interest to us. Um, <coughs> and the theorem says roughly the following. So whenever you have, <coughs> so you replace this Bianchi manifold by one, by a similar kind of gadget, which has a complex structure, an algebraic structure. And now again, you look at uh, so the homology with uh, FP or FP bar coefficients I should have probably taken to get enough uh, eigenclasses. Uh, so for any system of Hecker eigenvalues, which you can see uh, in this mod P homology, you can lift all of them to <coughs> the Hecker eigenvalues of a classical cusp form on X gamma, so something which corresponds to an automorphic representation uh, for this group G. And so this makes extensive use of the periodic geometry of this field. So uh, what I mean by this, so um, the rational numbers can be completed in different ways. They can either be completed to get the real numbers, or you can also put a different absolute value on Q, and I mean the periodic absolute value, and if you compute for this, you get the periodic numbers. And so because the sky lives over the rational numbers, essentially, you can also base change to a periodic field instead. To the periodic analog of the complex numbers is called CP. And then <coughs> there's also an analog of, like over the complex numbers, if you have an algebraic variety, you can pass to a manifold by taking the points, the complex points of the sky. Uh, and there's an analog of this of passing from an algebraic variety of a periodic field to a, some kind of periodic analytic space. Uh, they were first defined by Tate as rigid analytic varieties. Um, there are other formalisms now uh, which work a bit more generally. All right, so I want to, I can't go back, so, sorry. Oop, doop, 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 doop. I want to, I want to s say <coughs> how one can get a hold uh, of this guy here. Um, I just want to give you an impression of uh, what the kind of uh, objects are that are involved in the proof. <coughs> So the first result one uses is a result from uh, Pierre de Koch theory. So Pierre de Koch theory is some kind of analog of Hodge theory over the complex numbers. So Hodge theory over the complex numbers essentially compares singular homology, which is a purely topological thing, with <coughs> the cohomology of differential forms, etc., which uh, um, is more uh, suitable for certain things. So for example, if you um, if you want to get the relation between, like what Franke did, the relation between um, the homology of these locally symmetric spaces and automorphic forms, you somehow have to relate the homology with some actual functions on the space, and that's done, done by some form of Hodge theory. And so similarly, in this periodic case, we use some form of periodic Hodge theory. And so <coughs> what this does is it compares mod P homology or cohomology uh, with a slightly weird object uh, the Itaco homology of mod P cusp forms. I don't want to say what I mean by this. Um, so such as the result was first stated by Faltings uh, in 2002 and in more general form uh, was proved in my paper on Pierre de Koch's theory. <coughs> and then one makes a very funny operation. Uh, so, is, uh, <coughs> so one can, so if in the comp, uh, in the let me go to the locally symmetric space again. So there, if you shrink the level more and more, so in the inverse limit, you get essentially back the, uh, the symmetric space X. And there is <coughs> some kind of analog of this operation in the periodic world, 
but you need, don't need to shrink the level completely. You just need to shrink it overall, uh, putting more and more congruences at p. And it's not clear that you can do such an operation in the world of periodic geometry, but uh, there's this notion of a perfectoid space, which is hard to explain intuitively. And this gadget turns out to be an example of such a guy. And one of the weird properties of perfectoid space allows you to replace this fancy Ital cohomology and what resulted by Grothendieck by a much more elementary concept, namely Czech cohomology, where you just cover your space by some opens and then build some easy chain complex using the values of this, uh, using some of the cusp forms on these pieces to get something. So that's a critical ingredient. The third critical ingredient is, uh, <coughs> is a periodic analog of the embedding of x into its compact dual. Let me ex just say what this means in the simplest case. So I, should, I said that this, this fancy perfectoid space here should be thought of as a periodic analog of just the symmetric space x. And so the, the symmetric space x, say if it's hyperbolic two space, it embeds into the one-dimensional complex projective line, which is some compact uh, variety. And uh, so in the periodic world, you have a similar map to some classical comp compact variety. So this, if you did the modular curves, then here it would just again be P1. So you have this map. Um, and all right. Um, using this map, <coughs> you can somehow actually get a hold on uh, the complex that computes uh, these mod p cusp forms here. So technically, well, you get some, this map is a finite in some sense, so if you take some nice cover of here, you can pull it back, get some nice cover here, use this to build the Chesh complex. And then <coughs> it's critical that this map has some nice properties with respect to the heck operators, and these allow you to uh, well, so already it's the first step, you have a relation to cusp forms, but they are still mod p, and what you need to do is somehow, and they only live on some affinoid pieces, and what you need to do is approximate them by characteristic zero global cusp forms, and that's what, possible u what is possible using this hot state period map. But I'll stop here. Thank you very much for this uh, lecture. Are there questions? There are no questions. Uh, just uh, to thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, can, go ahead. You, can you roughly explain where the symmetry comes in, where you need it? Uh, you mean like in these locally symmetric spaces? Yes. Um, <coughs> No, I mean, well, you need a space with a high group of symmetries because you want to take these quotients by these uh, arithmetic groups. So you need a space where this arithmetic group can act. And so you need a space which is highly symmetric to begin with in order to take this quotient. Thank you. So you mentioned this conjecture. Bergeron Vengatesh, does right. it have some bearing on this conjecture? Uh, no, I, th I think those are just two different directions. So. But I think it's an interesting conjecture to have in mind in order to appreciate what it means to talk about the torsion class. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, the methods used to attack this conjecture of Bergeron and Vengatesh are, of course, also very different. They're completely analytic, whereas these are very number theoretic.